Marcus Brooch joins me this week to talk about opening a craft brewery in Burgundy, France. This is Beersmith Podcast number 236. This is Beersmith Podcast number 236, and it's late May 2021. Marcus Bruch joins me this week to talk about opening a craft brewery in Burgundy, France. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for homebrewers and beer lovers. They offer exclusive access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. And also the Brew Commander, the new brew house controller from Blickman Engineering. It's available in electric and gas propane models. The patent-pending Brew Commander is a high-quality brew house controller that offers automated step mashing, boil timers, precision temperature control, and advanced settings. Command your brew day with a new Brew Commander. To order yours today, visit BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, I want to introduce the web-based version of Beersmith 3 coming in June. It'll be launching with a full-featured web-based recipe editor that you can access from any web browser. This gives you access to your Beersmith recipes from a laptop, desktop, or even your mobile device by just logging into the web. The new Beersmith web will be available to any Gold Plus subscribers, so subscribe now to Beersmith 3, and you'll access both the traditional desktop program as well as the new web version at one low price. Check out beersmith.com blog to learn more about, about Beersmith or the web release, which comes in June. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome Marcus Bruch. Marcus is a home brewer who eventually opened a craft brewery in Burgundy, France. He joins us today to talk about opening a craft beer brewery in France and some of the lessons he's learned along the way. Marcus, it's, uh, it's great to have you on the show. How are you doing? Hi, Brad. Thank you. I'm doing fine. Thank you uh, to be on your show. So uh, you open a brewery in France. Where, where exactly are you located? Um, we are located about 25 miles, 30 kilometers southwest of Bonn. And Bonn is the center of the Burgundy, where Dijon is in the north, and then there's the Côte d'Or, there's Bonn, and then we are in the south towards the Côte Chalonnaise. And we are located right on the Canal du Centre, uh, which is basically the one of the main thoroughfares going from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic and had a huge uh, impact on the French industrialization. So, yes. Sounds like a beautiful location. Are you right on the canal then? Uh, yes, actually, we are right more right in the canal, uh, maybe about 50 yards. So, yes. Um, but, yeah, it's and it, we have a little harbor uh, where the brewery is at. And in the olden days, that was actually one of the major harbors where they would change the coal which from the, the mines which were up the canal uh then on, put it on, on smaller boats down the canal and uh we were talking a little bit before the show this is this is more of your second career too like me you've taken up a second second <laughs> you're making a change in life right yes yes i uh, was in the computer security industry networking um, industry and after i took my retirement i actually uh, started about building this brewery and that has really been a dream of mine for many years to have my own little brewery and we uh, did that in the last uh, year and actually were able to open the brewery in the, the, fourth, uh, the 14th of uh, July uh, last year. Awesome. Uh, so a uh, pursuing your second career much like I am, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Somewhere along the line, you, know, you, you had enough of it. So, yes, let's do something fun. I, I've certainly enjoyed my second career doing Beersmith. So, uh, but before we dive into the details of opening your brewery, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the growth of craft beer in Europe and, and specifically uh, France the last few years. As I understand it, um, you know, craft beers are starting to pop up all across Europe, right? Yeah, it is. That is actually true. And, um, um, I actually updated my knowledge this morning uh, from the, there's a, uh, a craft beer uh, association, uh, if you will, the, it's the syndicate uh, 
National of Independent Brewers in France. And I just updated the information from there. And actually in 2020, there were 300 new craft breweries opened in France. Wow. And so there are about 2,000 uh, craft breweries in France, um, which basically just make local beer. Interesting enough, in the same uh, token I read that uh, still 60% of the beers uh, drunk in uh, France, and every French person drinks about 33 liters of beer a year, uh, come from Belgium. So, and France itself exports very, very little beer and that towards the south, towards Spain. Um, in Switzerland, for example, that's where I'm from, they have something like 900 craft breweries in a country which has about 800, 8 million, 8 million people, wow. sorry, not 800, 8 million people. And in France, there are about 60 million, 65 million people, and they have over 2,000 craft breweries. Um, there's really, that trend is, is, is really there. Uh, people actually are looking for um, craft breweries. Uh, interestingly enough, I know from Germany, there the trend is not as prevalent, just because of the German um, purity laws. It mm -hmm. makes it more difficult for them to have a craft brewery, for example, to make a New England IPA, where you, you have the, the hazy and the juice and all those type of things in it. So, yes. And uh, you know, what styles of beer are they brewing at a lot of the European craft breweries? Is it following along like we do here with the IPAs, or are they doing uh, something different? They, 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 uh, they are make, they may have, they are making some IPAs, but uh, typically even the the, the, the craft breweries uh, around here in in our region where I'm at, they're probably about uh, six or eight. Uh, and they are basically making traditional beer styles. So they make a blonde, a, a, a Helles, uh, they have a pale ale, uh, they may have a, a brown ale and, and um, you know, a, 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 maybe an IPA, but nowhere near at the le bittering level as it is in the United States. And sour beers, that is at this point unheard of over here. And it has a lot, that has a lot to do with the, um, given the fact that France is a wine country, and uh, the Breton Amusus is really the enemy of the vintner. So um, a sour beer around here is really frowned upon. Just, yeah, it's like, are you guys crazy? You know, because it, it ruins my wine. So, yes. So it sounds like a mix of European lagers and uh, perhaps a few English styles thrown in primarily yes. then? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then... Um, and Belgian, then, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. yeah, Belgium, yes. And then, then the, the, the Belgium wits then are a very, um, I mean, they are also prevalent. So, yeah, the Belgium wits. Me and our brewery, we have not ventured out to there yet, um, just because I'm making ales. And so um, I just have not gone to a, a, a Belgium style beer. Uh, also, because I really, at this point in time, I'm reluctant to use sugars, but, you know, like, uh, and the sugar of things like that so yes and how do you think it compares to the u.s craft beer revolution which is now i don't know something like 20 we're like 20 years into it i think now yeah or, or even more yes no it, it um europe in my in, in my estimate when i was looking around and when we're looking around what the market looks like at opening our brewery mm -hmm. is probably about 10 years behind uh the americans in in, in their revolution but it also has to do with the Americans in terms of their culture are not much less traditional, like the Germans, a Swiss or a French would be. Mm -hmm. So um, the first question that I get when people come to breweries is, what is your blonde, which is the French term for a Helles, you know, for a, a, like just a pale, pale lager. lager yeah. beer. And um, so, so they, they, are, they are not that adventurous yet. Uh, I mean, the younger people, they are the, 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 I see it in the younger people, they are excited to say, oh, hey, we have a cool world, we look at that and make a different beer style. It's so all those type of things. So that's that's great. But as I said, they're probably about a good 10 years behind the U.S. trends. Hmm. And has there, been a, has there been a push there for, you know, brew local, if you will? There's a, there's a big movement here now to brew local, with, you know, use local ingredients, try and get locally sourced grains, local hops even in some cases. Uh, actually, there is. Uh, I had very uh, good feedback in our brewery 
saying oh, it's great that you look you use uh, local things and that is really also uh, what we uh, put on the, on the banner of our brewery in the sense of we're using local uh, grains. Uh, we're working with uh, two uh, uh, local malteries, uh, which are more artisan malteries. So mm -hmm. one of them is just a couple, uh, you know, uh, a wife and a husband. They they are they are malteries. I'm using hops from the Elsass, which mm -hmm. is you know there's not because we're we're too far south for a uh, a hop grower. And so, but but the Elsass is is far enough north, um, and they have they have very nice hops up there. I'm using uh, the Strisselspalt and the Nugget, which are really very nice ones. So yes, but I mean there is a movement in France to to, to and people like to have uh, local uh, ingredients in their beers. Yes, awesome. Well, tell us a little bit about your story. Uh, as I understand it, you started out as a home brewer, and I think you were in the U.S. too, right? Yes, yes, I was in the United States. Um, I was living then in the United States and working there. And in 1992, my wife gave me a uh, home brewing kit, which were then prevalent. Then you could have, I think, uh, she found it in, in the, uh, the home brew store. So it's, it's a box with all the ingredients in there. And it just basically, it uh, was, was a, uh, okay. a, a concentrated kit, yes, with the, the yeast and all that in there. And it just, and then I made that beer, and um, and it turned out really good. And actually, um, just a little side story there: my mom was actually there visiting us. Um, so um, so I made this beer, and you know she was looking at me like, you know, what are you doing? Because I had the water and the pots and the stove, and the house was smelling from the boiling and all that. So yes, <laughs> uh, so I then uh, really I really took a uh, liking to that and started to increase my home brewing um, at the end of progress about the 50 or 60 liter uh, boiling pot with a big gas burner and and then there was brewing out in the patio and having a uh, refrigerator in the garage with a uh, temperature control on it so that wow. i don't know whether you remember at this point in time they were those little temperature gauges where you had the temperature probe inside the fridge and outside the little wheel and then you just turn the power on and off to the fridge as the temperature was needed because and they just put the refrigerator on as low lowest possible settings so to keep keep the the, the the fermentation temperature more or less stable in southern california so yeah i think you mentioned something about the maltose falcons as well yes the best homebrew club in the United States. <laughs> I'm, I'm not biased, but okay. <laughs> Certainly um, one of the larger yeah, I, ones in the United States. Yeah, very popular. Yeah, yeah, very popular. And I mean, they really have, you know, have really uh, wonderful um, guys there, and wonderful homebrewers there. Many are beer judges. Um, John, the owner of uh, the, the club, is really a cool guy and, and, and uh, helps out the club and all that. So, yes. I uh, became a Maltos Falcon and uh, then joined the meetings and all that. And of course, went to the competitions. And so, yeah, and, and we, with a, a friend of mine, uh, also Maltos Falcon, we then made a Belgium triple and we won together um, the best of show of the Mayfair, which is the annual uh, homebrew competition that Maltos Falcons put on. So, Grover Voss uh, was a, a, a great contributor to to uh, that win. So yes, still you know shouts out to uh, Grover and thank you. So how did you go from hanging out with the Maltos Falcons in California to opening a brewery in uh, northern France? No, um, no, no, it's 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 in 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 the, the, the it's the eastern part of France. I'm sorry, nor eastern France. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's like in, in the well, yeah, sort of the, towards the southeast. I mean, the, the, yeah, anyway, um, well, I uh, moved back to Europe in 2006 and um, moved back to Switzerland with my, my whole family. And then in 2015, we actually bought a house down here in the Burgundy. Uh, so we have a, a little bed and breakfast and a, a vacation house. Nice. Uh, which which can be rented even by Americans once the borders are open again. Yeah. And uh, then I uh, took my retirement and 
decided to open the brewery. We found then a, a, a location, a building where we want to put the brewery in there. That, of course, was a disaster because that building was empty for about six or seven years. So there was a lot of work which needed to be done to clean it up, to uh, uh, take all the insulation out, which was uh, rotten and dirty. And of course, all the electricity needed to be get done new and all that. So that was then the, the, the tough part to get the brewery going. And I mean, what motivated you to take on opening a brewery at this point? Uh, it really was uh, one of my dreams. And we basically made a business study, a, a business case, and figured if we stay small enough, our financial exposure won't be that that uh, great. We are living really in uh, a rural part of France, so our uh, overheads are reasonable. You know, and so it was really just, hey, you know, you always want to have a brewery. You can make good beers. Uh, you can make good tasting beers that the home brews that I made, you know, friend says, hey, you need to make some more of that stuff. The stuff is really, really good. And so it's just basically at this point in time, a hobby, a fun things, but actually I get to sell the beer to the public and the people like it. So it's great. Awesome. Well, um, what were some of the challenges you ran into trying to get the brewery open? You already mentioned the building was a, was a bit of a challenge. Yeah, the, the, the building was, 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 of course, was a disaster. And, um, and and the electricity was a disaster. So, I mean, but that is just really a lot of work. I think the biggest challenges really uh, were was the getting the alcohol license to be able to sell uh, alcohol on the premises. So, you know, here in France, you don't have to have an alcohol license to sell beer if you just um, deliver to a grocery store. Okay. But if you want to sell it on premise and if you want to sell it on a tap, mm -hmm. then you need to have an alcohol license. And there are limits on um, how many alcohol licenses a village can have, and that limit is based on how many people live in that village. And so that was the biggest challenge. And we actually had a lot of help from uh, the local mayor. Uh, he really was uh, you know, all, all uh, uh, aimed for it once they presented the project uh, at the, at the, the Marriott and told them you know, what we wanted to do. And so he, he supported us all the way and he actually um, then made a deal with another village which doesn't have a restaurant to get that alcohol license transferred. And that is a common way to do, but the two mayors then have to work together and exchange money and all those those type of things. So that was really the biggest challenge. And the next uh, challenge really was then to get um, just the building done because, for example, the, uh, the top of the roof is about five and a half yards off the ground. So we needed to take uh, old roofing down. And so, you know, at five and a half meters up or five and a half yards up, it starts to become complicated and dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, because yeah, if you fall five meters down, you die. It's that simple. So, um, so, so that was another challenge. And that was really a lot of work. And they had, um, I really had a lot of friends uh, helping me, um, they the shouts, go out to Jim, uh, Mark and Rachel, Isaac, um, uh, HP, Fuzzy. They are really people which, you know, they, they stuck with me and says, Hey, come on, Marcus, we'll help you. And, uh, uh helped us out, which it would not have been possible, uh, without to do without them. Um, the, in terms of the regulations, it's really, uh, since we're relatively small, um, we can get away with many things because the regulations here in France are such as if you're a small brewery, for example, you don't have to put up the alcohol tax um, up front. They uh, let you declare the alcohol you produce and then you pay the alcohol tax, which, mm -hmm. you know, which is normal. But for a large brewery, they, they say, okay, you make 50,000 liters of beer, 
So you need to come up with 10,000 euros or $10,000 of alcohol tax up front. And then, then, then you declare what you made and then we, we, we give you the money back or we, we keep it if you made more than that. Mm -hmm. And so that, of course, that helped us a lot. So in that respect, um, that was uh, very nice and, and, and um, um, you know, that really helped us a lot. So is it a is but, it a flat tax on the alcohol or how does that? Work? Um, it's it's the, the way it is. It's right now. It's a uh, three euro seventy five or three and a half dollars per hundred liters per degree of alcohol. Okay. So that is that is not really all. You know, it's not it's not really all that much. I mean, it's like forty fifty euros, whatever. Uh, so it's really not all that much. Uh, because again, because we are small brewery, uh, larger breweries, they uh, pay more. Mm. Um, and actually there was in that report that I read this morning, um, around year 2000, if I remember correctly, the French government increased the alcohol tax by 160%. And that had a huge financial impact uh, on breweries. And actually uh, so, some breweries, um, uh, went out of business because they couldn't pay the tax anymore. Hmm. So that was so that that was really interesting. The the next thing is what's really a, a, a challenge, particularly in France. I'm not so sure whether it's in other countries, but uh, to find the right people in any type of government or customs type office is really really difficult. But once you find the people, the right person, they they are very very helpful. But to find that that person is really really difficult. Uh, and particularly then for me, uh, you know, I'm a native German speaker. I speak relatively good English. And the whole thing in French starts to be, become then uh, really difficult. So also the French language there is still today a, uh, a challenge uh, in, in, in everyday work. If I are able to face to face with a person, it's OK. On the telephone, it becomes really difficult. But you did mention the mayor and some other people were helpful along the way, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. Very much so. Very much so. The, the mayor of Saint Lucia, where our uh, brewery is at, uh, he's he's been very very helpful. Uh, this, I mean, he's really an interesting character. He's about eighty five or eighty six years old. He's been mayor for in this village for the last thirty five years. Wow. And he was actually in the French Navy on a destroyer um, during the Second World War. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. <laughs> So yes. Well, so. Um, how large is your brewery? And uh, um, you know, did you have partners along? The, well, I'll start with how large the brewery is. Yeah. Um, so our brew house is a two hundred liter. That's about fifty four gallons, I guess. Yeah. Um, no, no, fifty four barrels. No, fifty four gallons. Sorry. Um, uh, it's about two hundred liters, and uh, we have three a three vessel brew house. So we have the the mash tun, the lager tun, and the boiling kettle. And I have 400 liter fermenters. So what I'm doing is I'm making two batches a day mm -hmm. and put them in the same fermenter. Uh, so I have at the end of the day, 400 liters of uh, finished beer. And the logic there really was um, it had to do with money. When you buy a large brew kettle, the price just more, more or less doubles. So you know, from 400 liter, from 200 liter to 400 liter, the price is almost double. But if you buy a larger fermentation uh, tank, mm -hmm. the price only increases maybe by 50 percent. Mm -hmm. So it was in terms of money, it was 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 more economic to buy the 200 liter brew house and say, okay, I exchange money for time and I make just two batches a day and put it into a 400 liter um, vessel. I didn't want to go larger and they also had to do with, again, financial exposure. Uh, I had a budget where I said, you know, I don't want to exceed that budget again to keep our our business model alive and saying we don't have to, uh, we don't have to produce 10,000 liters and sell 10,000 liters to be uh, at least breaking even. So, so yeah, so that worked out for our business plan and for our mm -hmm. financial plan. And how do you distribute? I mean, is it mainly out of the tap room or do you actually package um, some of it? Do you have growlers? I have no idea. Yes. Um, the thing is, yeah, now during the, the lockdowns, uh, of course, I cannot 
uh, sell out of the tap room because the outlet's locked down. Um, but between the first and the second lockdown, we have the tap room open and basically have like a community table where people can sit down and uh, drink our beers. And we have a plan to ex expand the bar and actually build the bar right now. We just have a a, uh, a refrigerator with four taps on it to, to let the beers out. Uh, we are in grocery stores and in specialty stores, so there are a bunch mm -hmm. of specialty stores around here which cater to tourists because again the canal is a very um, attractive tourist destination because it's no longer used for industrial use but it's used for pleasure boating mm -hmm. so there there are many uh people which travel through here and so they stop at the brewery we are in the grocery store so i have a bottling line we can make 33 centiliters and half liter bottles. And that's also a thing I would love to go into cans, but this is a cultural thing here in France with a aluminum can in, in a nice restaurant, that's not working. Hmm. And because again, we are here in, in, in the Burgundy, you know, this, 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 this is wine country. And so we need to have the beer in, in a glass bottle. And that's what I'm doing I'm packaging. I have here, um, possibility to fill up kegs, 20 liter kegs, um, to uh, sell to the restaurants and all that. But again, the restaurants are not open yet. Uh, they, I think, open on the 15th or the 19th, at least under the terraces, but inside they're still not open. So that has not been an issue yet. Um, did you have any partners along the way opening the beer, opening the brewery? As a partners in terms of uh, business partners uh, or well you mentioned uh, a lot of people helped you certainly yeah you have you have a lot of people helping me we we had you know, we had some um local craftsmen helping us uh installing things uh, uh for example the waterline the waterline was too important to me to tackle that myself so i wanted to have a proper plumber uh installing that for me because again if my water supply stops yeah, that's the end of the brewery for a while, at least. Uh, also, the electrician, uh, because we are a, a full electric brewery in the sense of all the heating elements are electric. Uh, so I have three phase, 380 volts, and they are did not feel comfortable to do that myself. Hmm. Um, but and are you, I assume you're, are you doing the brewing yourself as well? Yes. Yes. Awesome. awesome. Yes, I'm. I'm. I'm the. That this is a, a brewer in the United States, and I forgot from where he was, but he made the point that he is the janitor, and 10% of the time he gets to brew beer. That's pretty much what I feel like. <laughs> uh, so, yes, I, I clean the brewery a lot. I work a lot. Since I'm a mechanical engineer, I um, feel very comfortable working with water lines, working with like, electricity, being installed all the brew house ourselves. Hmm. Uh, I had a, a lot of help installing uh, the cooling pipes for the fermenters. Um, you know, I have a, a, a 600 liter uh, glycol water tank. And so, so, I mean, I feel very comfortable to do that. And hmm. that is really something which uh, you know, my lesson really was, yeah, so you're a home brewer and think you're going to build a brewery. You better understand something about the electricity, about mechanical things. You better understand how to put uh, pipes together and make all that stuff to work. And then, of course, there's always troubleshooting. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, what styles of beer did you decide to focus on uh, at your brewery? Uh, yeah, we put a lot of uh, effort and thought into that. And again, you know, this is, uh, the Burgundy, uh, we are basically in rural place. Saint Léger, where the brewery is at, is has about fifteen hundred people. The village next to it, where I'm living, has about three hundred and fifty people. So we really are out in the countryside. Mm -hmm. Except, of course, the canal is a is a, is a major thoroughfare, uh, and so the, the street along the canal is also a major thoroughfare. So it's really interesting. Um, we basically decided, or I, I decided, I want to have a blonde, but you know, I am using a style of a California common because 
Fritz Maytag and the Anchor Brewing Company is still one of my heroes. Um, very early on, I remember, I think one of the first craft brews that I ever drank was an Anchor Steam, and then right after that, a, uh, a Boston. My, myself uh, as well, actually. I, yeah. I remember Anchor Steam going all the way back well into the 80s, you know. Exactly. And I've, exactly. Had, I've had them on the show, too. It was great. I had, uh, had Anchor on, uh, I don't know, like a year and a half ago. Yeah, I know. I, I listened to their podcast, and it was it was real fun, real fun to, to listen to them and, and the things he says. Is, yes, that's exactly. You know, I mean, I was a part of that, or or, or was around the mentors happened. So yes. So uh, so, I make, so you make it. Make, so you make a you make a blonde that's something like an anchor steam beer, I guess. Yes, I'm. Uh, uh, you know, I'm. I, I feel good about it because. I think in that podcast show, actually, the brewer said that Fritz Maytag concentrated the first seven years perfecting his anchor steam. So, yes, I'm working on perfecting my anchor steam. Interesting. My California common. California common, yeah. Yes. And um, then the second beer is a uh, Burton and Trent style pale ale. Mm -hmm. Um, Just... Yeah, just a, a, a straight pale ale. Uh, one of, nice one of my favorites, actually. Yeah. And then I'm making a uh, Irish red. Um, and so, yes, that, that's... Uh, and, and I have to explain to my French customers because they are used to a red beer being a creek, which is, you know, a bit... Sorry. Yeah, c- creek, yeah. Yeah, it's a, a, a creek. It, it, it's, it's a bit beer. And um, uh, so I have to tell them, yeah, listen, my, my wheat beer is not um, a, um, a, a fruity beer. I achieve the red color with a malt, with a uh, toasted malt. And so then they're happy with that. And so that's then the strongest in terms of alcohol, in terms of uh, hops, and in terms of uh, malt aromas, because yes, I'm going a little bit there in, into the multi side yes so our, then uh, also, uh, let's see you've gone over right. i think three beers so far yeah and then we make our specialty beer so i uh, made last year together with the um uh, brewers association uh, in uh, france they uh promoted um a beer and and encouraged craft breweries to use fresh hops green hops in a beer and so we work together with uh, hops growers in the Elsass they would um, uh, literally um, get the hops of the wines on Monday and on Tuesday morning it was in my brewery and I made a beer with it and uh, actually it turned out very nice uh, this is the first time I made a beer with uh, green hops which is real fun uh, to, to brew, um, the taste was great. It was a little bit difficult to clean up uh, the brew house afterwards because you have hop leaves everywhere and they very tight in every pump. So that was um, so I have to learn there a little bit. How do I like use a, a larger bag or a better filter or something like that? Um, what really was uh, great in that beer is because it's the hops flower, so the pollens were still in there, the the the, the yellow, you know, the yellow dust. And that added a sweetness to the beer. So, which is, it really turned out very nicely because then it would balance the, the malt with the sweetness. So, it really turned out uh, uh, as a nice beer. And they're going to make one this year again. Nice. And yeah. They, we, the, last, uh, the last podcast episode, I had somebody on who's, uh, they, were, they were freezing, uh, well, fa- fast freezing green hops. And they, uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, they mentioned you. You do get a very unique flavor out of it. Um, a lot yeah, of time, you do yeah. get more of the vegetal or, or uh, you know, the green flavors out of it. But um, did you see any of that in the beer you made? Um, no, I didn't. Didn't get uh, vegetable. I really got a very nice hoppy um, floral, um, yeah, and, and, and uh, uh, floral type um, taste. Um, and the, the yeast that we actually wind up receiving. Uh, was a, a yeoman, so it was a it's a, uh, a version of the, if I remember correctly, of the uh, the, the the 
the British Brewers Gold, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. So it's called yep. Yeoman. And um, and, it was, and it was really interesting because at one point we actually should have gotten our hops a week earlier, but the hop grower missed the cutoff time for the transport. So we had to wait wait another three or four days to get, get our hops because, you know, green hops is very volatile. Yeah. So it needs to be packed and shipped right away. It cannot uh, stand there for, um, you know, an extended period of time, meaning two or three days. So, yes. And then, uh, so, I mean, that, that, really, that beer really turned out well. And uh, then I made a, uh, a saison. It's called the Blue Moon Saison. I made during the 31st of October last year, during the, um, the second full moon in, in October. And that one turned out really, really nice too, uh, much to my surprise. Um, it, it, uh, I used red, uh, the rosé pepper, and so I helped the yeast a little bit along with the slightly peppery note. and. Um, we actually uh, won a silver medal on the Lyon um, beer competition this year for uh, with that blue moon. So that was you know, that was fun. And uh, then I made a uh, brun or brown a doppelbock, um, yeah, a brown uh, ale uh, during the winter solstice. And you know, if you recall, in the winter solstice there was. Jupiter and uh, Saturn were in a line. I do recall that. And it was the, 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 the great conjunction. So, yeah, we made the great conjunction double buck. Uh, and um, that really has a lot of uh, caramel and a slight hint of uh, coffee. And so that, that one also tur turned out very nice. So those are our uh, specialty beers so far. And I'm in the process right now to make a uh, summer solstice beer. I probably want to put there some um, cloves or maybe a cardamom in there to make it like a, a refreshing summer beer. So that's the plan so far. Sounds nice. Uh, so, yeah. hey, um, what styles are popular in France now as far as craft breweries? Is it primarily the styles you mentioned? Yeah, that's, I mean, that, that, that's really, I mean, the, the, all the craft brewers that I look around, they all have a blonde, they all have a, an amber, if you will, and uh, they, they, they have a, a brown. So that is so pretty much the, the gamut. And then they're, they're the, the specialty beers. And uh, yeah, what I forgot to mention is we also made a Christmas beer. So I made a Christmas beer with the, the Christmas spices, so cinnamon, cardamom, uh, cloves, and nutmeg, and uh, for that, act and I put in uh, apple juice. Um, so, so to, to in, in the, the in in the fermentation, and actually for that, we won the gold medal in Lyon this year. So yeah, wow. I also Fantastic. got that. So yes, yes. So that was I mean that was that was really fun. And one of the most interesting thing thing is. I had maybe about a month ago a couple coming in and they wanted to buy some beer and they did and uh, the lady says you know i had your christmas beer this is the best beer that ever tasted in my life so like whoa nice. that's cool to hear so yes well um the last topic i want to talk about you had mentioned to me that you have a real focus on water and i think you're uh, uh working a lot are you working directly from ro water uh, yes, I um, invested actually quite a lot of money um, into a reverse osmosis system, and I have basically a industrial grade reverse osmosis system. Mm -hmm. um, I can make about 200 liters water in a night in about eight hours. Uh, and that was really one of the things which you needed to do. The thing is, we have city water, so we don't have a well. We have city water, which is you know really good water to drink. Uh, however, since it is treated, it um, has chlorine in it. I don't mm. know, I have that in my beer. And it also gives me the possibility to mix actually the different beer styles. So I can now, of course, um, make the water to match a particular beer style. So the Burton and Trent, I'm making a little bit of a harder um, water using the water analysis from Burton and Trent. 
So I add the salt myself. If we're going to make a uh, an Irish ale, I'm using uh, a water analysis from pork for the Big Deeper Common. I got the one from uh, San Francisco. And I add then the minerals in those proportions that I can achieve that particular mineral content and hardness for the beer. Obviously, I also have to uh, uh, add the, the acids because, yeah, I want to I wanna be at... 5.2 uh, pH uh, during my mash. So, so, but given the fact that I then start with the water, which it's basically zero, I uh, I I can achieve 10 micro Siemens conductivity in my water, which is basically without any minerals. Um, so then, uh, so then I can start from zero and add the things. Uh, the ingredients which I need to have for the particular beer style. So that gives you a lot of flexibility build, building yes. all the water up from scratch, right? Yes, exactly, yes. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, well, is, go ahead, I'm sorry. The, the thing is what, what I just, well, we're using a farmer to give him our um, um, used spent grains. And he knows a mayor in another village, and they have to actually have a um, a, a well, a, a, a living well uh, in the village. And so the plan is there for one of the next beers that I go with a 500 liter water tank up there and get um, the water from that well to make a beer which is not truly local. So I have the local water and with the local ingredients and the hops from the Alsace. So yes, so I'm looking forward to that. So that's a project sometime after the summer. Sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, I wanted to get your closing thoughts on some of the lessons learned uh, in opening your own brewery in France. Okay. Um, the, okay, the lessons learned there really is, first of all, do not underestimate the amount of time and work it is to open a brewery when you think well just you know set up set set up the brewery and then start brew beer says yeah except that's the last 10 percent there's 90 percent that you have to do up front uh the other thing is again you know the alcohol license can really become tricky um also there for example for, for the price also there, there are two things with the alcohol license one of them is they are limited amounts the other, other one is you have to take a class in French and pass the test to be able to sell alcohol um, to the public uh, in a bar so that's a little bit of a challenge plus depending on where you live the price of the alcohol license varies widely uh, I know from brewers in, um, in in Lyon that's where I had, had to take the class which is south of here Mm -hmm. uh, they pay close to a thousand euros a month for their alcohol license. We don't pay that because mm -hmm. we're not in a large city. There's not that, you know, there's not that demand for it. So yes. So that's the alcohol license is certainly going to be the issue. Then it just, um, all the, uh, although the, I mean, the, the, the organizations are helpful, but as I said before, just to find the right person in the customs office to tell that he tell you tells you what you need to do to declare your alcohol taxes uh, it's not simple um then finding the proper craftsmen which do the work in the proper quality and here i am in swiss you know i have sort of um the thing of for per perfection but actually uh over a large degree it's it, it's self-serving and it makes sense because if you shoot something to be perfect you're, ne you're never going to achieve that because something always is going to go wrong and so um uh, then you basically achieve good enough because you were shooting for perfection sorry that's my coffee machine that's okay <laughs> so, yeah. go ahead so, go ahead and finish i'm sorry uh, uh, yeah so uh, those are the um uh, those are the uh, the challenges uh, which uh, I found also make sure that you uh, have a good relationship with City Hall. And the way it actually works is 
The mayor is the mayor, yes, but really the person which runs the village is his secretary. So you better make sure that you have a good connection to the mayor and to the secretary because they can help you. Also, they they also can break you. Uh, just because there is a lot of uh, uh, procedures and protocols and and and, and processes. Uh, in place, and they can basically so go around it or actually adhere to the letter. And if they adhere to the letter, then you have problems. Uh, just in terms, for example, for the handicap access, uh, for uh, the safety uh, inspection for the building, uh, those type of things. So they can be a little bit more lenient or they can be really, really strict. Mm -hmm. So again, making good uh, relations with um, City Hall. Uh, and the mayor and the secretary really helps and then find a uh, good trustworthy uh, craftsman because that also can uh, throw a huge kink into a plan to build a brewery if the electrician doesn't show up for two days. And, you know, it's like, well, why aren't you here? Well, I was busy. So like, so you stand there, it's like, well, but I need to have my electricity. So yeah, so those type of things. So again, find some uh, trustworthy uh, uh, craftsmen. So that really helps. Well, I want to give you one last chance to mention, uh, I don't know if you have a website or uh, or if you, maybe you could just mention your location again uh, for where yes. you're located. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so we have a website. Uh, so we are Instagram and Facebook. The brewery is called Bright Star Brewery. Um, that really has to do with, I was living on Bright Star Street in, uh, in, in Thousand Oaks in California. And uh, so it's the Bright Star Brewery, Instagram and Facebook. We have a, a website, brightstarbrewery.beer. And um, uh, so, yes, and the village is called saint Uh It's in the Sonne Loire uh, region in uh, Department 71. And you know, we have a bed and breakfast. So, yes, it is possible to visit our brewery and sleep in the village uh, next to it. So, yeah. Um, I mean, I encourage my American uh, friends to come over here. We have fun, we have good beers, and there's some good wines too. So, yeah. Well, uh, hopefully things will be opening up again soon so we can all get out there. But, uh, but Marcus, yes. it's, been a, it's been a great pleasure having you on the show today. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you. It's really good um, to be on your show. Uh, I'm a huge fan of your show, and uh, I listen to it. And, well, thank you for having me. Today, my guest was Marcus Bruch. He's a longtime home brewer and now a professional brewer in Burgundy, France. Thanks again, Marcus. Pleasure. A big thank you to Marcus Bruch for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They offer access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com. And also the Brew Commander, the new brew house controller from Blickman Engineering. It's available in electric and gas propane models. The patent pending Brew Commander is a high quality brew house controller that offers automated step mashing, boil timers, precision temperature control, and advanced settings. Command your brew day with a new Brew Commander. To order yours today, visit BlickmanEngineering.com. For more information, again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, I want to introduce the new web-based version of Beersmith coming in June. We'll be launching a full-featured web-based recipe editor that you can access from any web browser. This gives you access to your Beersmith recipes from a laptop, desktop, or even your mobile device by just logging into the web browser. The new Beersmith web will be available to any Gold Plus subscriber and work with the traditional Beersmith desktop program. Check out beersmith.com slash blog to learn more about the upcoming Beersmith web and the release in June. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. Thank you.